Time for questions to Minister for Finance, and we will start with listed questions. I call Maris Bradley. Thank you very much, Deputy Principal Speaker. Question number one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bradley. It's, a, it's a, an, an almost empty chamber, uh, and that, that, doesn't do, that doesn't do this, uh, this question justice. Um, and with your permission, uh, Concordia, I'll take uh, questions 1 and 13 together. Uh, the business rate relief scheme will be continued for another year to allow time for the recommendations from the policy evaluation to be introduced. This work was undertaken, as you know, by Neil Gibson's economic policy unit at the University of Ulster. I don't actually think it's Neil Gibson's economic policy unit, but the economic policy unit which he heads. The study found that although the current scheme was a useful intervention during the recent downturn, it did not have enduring economic impact <clears throat> either for the local economy or for those who gain from it. It is simply too thinly spread. Accordingly, I would like to bring forward a more targeted uh, scheme, and we'll be bringing forward proposals to the Assembly uh, later this month, next, next week, I hope, in relation to a range of measures which, taken together, will help stimulate economic activity. Boris Bradley for Principal supplement. Deputy Speaker, I uh, thank the, the Minister for his, his answer there. And as he knows, we're about to uh, host the Open Golf Championships in 2019, an opportunity to sell Northern Ireland PLC. And we need thriving town centres uh, to showcase and hopefully entice our visitors to come back. I welcome the Minister's answer and I look forward to his response coming back in the near future. Thank you for his, uh, his supplementary. Um, I had the great pleasure of visiting Port Roush uh, the week before last uh, to see the early preparations for the Open. Uh, I was very impressed by the commitment, uh, not only of Royal Port Roush, but of the local community to making sure that the benefits of the Open are felt across uh, the region, and Port Roush in particular, but across the region, but not only in, in 2019, but in, in, in the period ahead. Uh, one of the issues that was very clear to me is that there are still a number of properties uh, in Port Roush, as you mentioned that, but this is true right across the piece in many of our towns, uh, uh, villages and our cities. The properties which we want to encourage people to bring back into use, especially retail properties. Uh, in that regard, a different issue, which I don't have responsibility for, but Urban Development Grant, I think, will play a huge, a huge part in this, and it does show the, the necessity for joined up government action. So I'm going to take some measures with the permission of the Assembly and Executive, because everything I come forward with will have to go forward to, for the agreement of the Executive, and of course the committees in the Assembly will have their say as well. Um, but I hope the measures I bring forward will really emphasise the fairness of the ratings uh, policy. Uh, and I'm talking about, uh, we're talking here about business rates, non-domestic, but also domestic rates. How do we get a, a fair system when we bring in 1.2 billion at the minute? Uh, and I know you would like to see that fairness, but also, this idea of seizing opportunity. If there are young people looking at an empty shop, whether it's on the Armour Road or whether it's in Ballymena or whether it's in Anaskill, looking at an empty shop unit and saying, I'd love to set up a business there, how do we give them a spur, give them encouragement to do that? And that's my intention. I'll bring those forward. Some more recommendations in that regard. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I know from years of personal experiences that businesses right across North Down are really feeling the strain of the rates burden. It's essential, therefore, that the Assembly continue to provide some support to them. But can the Minister explain to me whether he has considered providing any temporary support for sectors that may be most disproportionately affected by changes in support under the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme? Thank you. Ira. Well, uh, thank you for that issue, and I have visited Bangor as well. I had a, a lunchtime meeting with those involved in the hospitality business. It started out quite well, and then after 30 minutes got on to rates, and the, the second 30 minutes were always uh, more heated and more contentious. And I suppose the, the, the problem is, I would say to the members, we do want to raise this 1.2 billion. We're trying to share it uh, in an equitable fashion, uh, but we do have a tax on business called rates. Uh, I'm not in favour of a, another raft of temporary measures, uh, but I am impressed by and have listened very carefully to the proposals put forward by Hospitality Ulster and by NERTA under, uh, under Glenn Roberts. Uh, I think they do talk a lot of sense uh, and they say that if you were to do more for hospitality, and I know that's a big part of the, the, the small uh, independent economy of, of North Down, of Bangor in particular, if we do more for the hospitality uh, providers, uh, that would help tourism. So then we get another example of a joined up economy and joined up government. So I'm listening very caref carefully to the presentation they made. I, I caught just a little bit when I attended the Finance Committee where Hospitality Ulster and Merta were making a presentation there as well. 
I have to say that I don't agree with everything that they said, but I do hope that uh, in short order we can bring forward proposals which are more focused, more focused on independent retailers and in particular, and in particular on the hospitality uh, sector. Aaron, sir, Sean Lynch. I get uh, to ask Can call you. When will the minister announce his vision for the rate system, Gormagan? Well, uh, I'm, I'm actually hopeful that we will do that uh, next Tuesday. Of course, uh, I want to cover a number of areas, and some of them did come up in the, the study uh, carried out by the University of Ulster. Uh, in particular, they were saying that the existing uh, rates relief scheme for small business is too, too, uh, di too, diffu too diffuse. Uh, it's not focused enough, and I'm taking that on board. I also like uh, a, a proposal they brought forward was about geographical areas, a, spe a special focus on areas perhaps which haven't prospered as much as we would like. So I hope next uh, Tuesday, I believe, to bring forward those proposals. I, there will be plenty of time for the Assembly, for the Executive to consider them, but I hope there will be buy-in. I think everybody realises that the worst of the recession is over, thank goodness. Uh, we have an opportunity now to, to accelerate the recovery, to move forward uh, at pace, and any proposals I bring forward will have uh, that uh, at their very heart. Uh, what we'll be trying to do, I can call you uh, and say to the members, try and get the balance right. Uh, we want to raise revenue for these vital public services that everyone is demanding. No one is suggesting we cut uh, funding to any of the frontline services. So if we have to raise that revenue, therefore, we need to find a, a fair and proportionate way to do that. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Minister. Can I ask um, you whether you believe that the regeneration bill should be brought forward and how you feel that this could and, and should interact with the um, Small Business Rates Relief Scheme? Thank you. Well, um, the Alliance Party always are extending and expanding my powers into other departments. Uh, I am, as you know, in our party, wishes to see uh, stepping up of the pace of uh, transfer of powers to councils in particular. And, and I am a fan of the 11 councils, and I bet them uh, to ask them would they uh, do more, and if they do more, we'll meet them halfway. Uh, I think the vital thing for, for all of us at the minute is that, uh, and I say this to, to every Assembly member, because I know you're deeply engaged in your constituency, I think we need the councils uh, and councillors to be more ambitious in the time ahead. And part of that, of course, is that they need to have more powers, but they shouldn't be held back. And I do meet some councils who are not as ambitious or bold as others. My view is that every council needs to be as bold as possible uh, in their vision and their plans for the future. Uh, that they should not be waiting for the Assembly to do more, and we will do more. Uh, they should be asking us to partner them in every way possible. But now is not the time, in my view, to be sitting on your hands. I call William Irwin. Uh, question number two. Uh, Gormaida, um, uh, I can appreciate that farmers who vacate an old farmhouse will not be happy paying rates on it whilst it lies empty. However, this is something that all owners of empty homes face, uh, and they have the same choice of letting it out or selling it on or continuing to pay the rates. If we were to grant an exemption, uh, I think it would have to apply to everyone holding a vacant residential property. To do so would, of course, lose the executive many millions of pounds a year in revenue, uh, and that money, as I said earlier, helps pay for essential public services and investment, health, education, and everything else we have responsibility for. And of course, our local councils would also lose out. Having said that, if the farmhouse is in poor repair, is no longer habitable without substantial restoration work, it, it can be removed from the valuation list, and rates are not payable. Uh, and in, in assessing whether a property can be occupied as a home, uh, land and property services will take into account the character of the property and whether a reasonable amount of work would render it habitable. Thank you. William Irwin for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Principal Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response. Currently, evaluation, evaluation of 20,000 or more makes a, a property liable uh, for empty homes rating. Would the Minister look at the possibility uh, of raising this threshold? I think this threshold is very, very low, and in effect, it means that many of these houses. I have one particular incident this week where a house hasn't been lived in for 32 years and still only received a 3,100 rates bill for five years back rate. Well, um I have sort of vowed not to introduce more reliefs in the short time ahead, uh, and we will we'll come forward then with some proposals around a small business. So the member wants to write to me in that regard, he may do so. He should be aware that I do receive a fair bit of correspondence from this. Uh, it strikes me as genuine correspondence, people who are in hardship, who have moved into a new home, as you say, maybe a, a generation ago, 
that find that it's not uh, easy or possible to rent the home, who have no family who wish to use it, uh, and therefore they have been left with a, uh, a problem uh, which is not easily resolved and ending up paying a bill each year for which they don't feel they get a reward. So I'm not, in the, I'm not minded right now to, to increase the threshold, uh, but I am aware of that hardship, and if the member wants to write to me, maybe we can explore certain instances within that. Aaron, sir, Mark Durkin. I call Mark. I'd like to ask the Minister if he could inform the House, is he considering any further exemptions on, on rating? I'm thinking maybe, for example, along the lines of credit unions. Um, well, point on Bwiaz or the cold as in question a car August Higlesh and Toiki Akai Ganaris. I want to thank the member for his uh, uh, visionary powers because it just so happens that his committee has written to me asking uh, would I consider rate relief for credit unions. Uh, that followed hot on the heels of the first letter I had received asking for relief from corporation tax. Uh, also from the committee in relation to credit unions, and um, I have no doubt they will mount up as well. Uh, I think, as he uh, and, and his city has made a big contribution to the credit union movement on this island, uh, I think credit unions do a, a great job for, uh, for society and for community. Happy to look at it. Um, I'm a member of a credit union. Um, they, uh, when they're managed prudently, they sometimes make some money and distribute that to their members. Uh, they do have to, I think, like everyone else, make a contribution to uh, keeping the lights lit and, and the public services we have. Uh, but I'm happy, I have received a letter and I'm happy to receive any further rep representations in that regard. But I, I wouldn't be making any promises. I wouldn't be making any withdrawals on this particular answer just at the minute. I call Cahill Boyle in Aram, sir. Cahill Boyle. Thank you, Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I could have just asked the Minister if he th considers that there's sufficient support for farmers in relation to. Uh, well, well, uh, of course, um, I don't think anyone believes that the rate reliefs are sufficient in their sector, but of course, uh, farm and farms and related buildings uh, are not rated, they're not subject to rates at all. Um, as well as that, a farmer uh, who needs to live on or near his or her farm, a reduction is applied uh, to the capital value, a uh, reduction of 20% to the value of the farmhouse. So, yes, there are. Um, to, to use the, the term Mr. Durgan used, there are, uh, in my view, generous reliefs uh, for agricultural land and for, and, for, and, and for farm houses at this time. I call Danny Kennett. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, will the Minister take the opportunity to review um, the legislation governing the effective date at which a new property or domestic dwelling becomes eligible for the payment of rates and at least? Issue fresh guidelines. I'm, I'm happy to look at, at all, all those issues, uh, and, and this is another issue that has come up in relation to uh, the immediate payment of, of uh, rates. But I'm looking forward to the day when some member stands up and says, because we need more money for education, because we need more money for health, uh, because we need more money for economic uh, uh, regeneration, I'm going to suggest we re someone we remove a relief from. I'm not going to be that person just yet, although I have some views on it next week. Uh, but uh, I'm, happy to, I'm, not, I'm not happy to review uh, the, the change suggested by a member at this, this minute, but I am sympathetic. But on the other hand, uh, someone will have to pay the rates to keep this uh, society going forward. And uh, at some stage, while we all like, I think, I, I think when I uh, reduced to zero the rates for community and amateur, amateur sports clubs, that was welcomed universally. But we're also going to have to find a way to say we think we can find extra money, extra money, not more release, but extra money uh, from, from, from the community to fund the services which the community needs and demands. I call Edwin Poots. To number three. Uh, it is public procurement policy that first tier subcontractors are paid within 30 days, uh, and the CPD, Central Procurement Directorate, has implemented a range of measures to ensure that subcontractors are paid promptly. Most recently, this has included the su successful rollout of project bank accounts, as the member will be aware. 
However, it also includes other practical measures, such as a requirement for project managers to monitor subcontractor payments at monthly progress meetings with the contractor. There is also a requirement for the client, main contractor and subcontractors to honour payments as they fall due by signing a fair payment charter. Edwin Poots for supplement. Thank you, Principal and Madam Deputy Speaker, and apologies for not being in my position yesterday um, for questions. Uh, in terms of this, uh, I think that the, the government's record in this is good uh, in, in ensuring that co main contractors are paid quickly, uh, but I think that main contractors are using subcontractors for banking purposes. And you mentioned project banks. I think that is used in a very limited way in the maintenance sector in particular. And would the Minister give us some assurance on the maintenance sector in particular that subcontractors will be paid promptly by the main contractors and we're not looking at people laying out hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, for several months who have already been paid uh, by the government for I, the work carried out? I thank the member for his apology and I just remind him that questions are supposed to be brief to the point. Minister. Well, uh, I thank the member too for, for his supplementary. Uh, this issue of, of uh, payment to subcontractors um, uh, and those farther down the line has, I think, it's been really been used since the Tiger collapse when a lot of people were left in the lurch. It has come up uh, on, on my watch on several occasions. So there are a lot of people concerned about this and making sure that, especially where public money is being spent. I mean, our, our purpose is when we are carrying out infrastructural investments that we get the money paid promptly to the main contractor, but we want that money uh, cascaded down through the entire uh, value stream and, and worker stream uh, throughout the contract. I want to make sure that happens. Uh, Patsy McGlone uh, had a separate meeting with me as the head of the all-party group uh, on, on procurement or on, 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 on infrastructural investment. And we touched on this issue and also the issue of retentions. And the member will know that sometimes that also can be a burden on those farther down the, the work chain that they are waiting for retention money when it doesn't really make much sense. So, yes, I think we are good at this in, public, in, in, in terms of making sure that, uh, that we have the right impact, uh, that people are paid promptly. But I'm happy to look again at the maintenance side if he thinks that perhaps we aren't just as, uh, uh, as efficient as we'd like to be in that sector. I called Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. Apologies for that, and thank you for the Minister for his, uh, uh, his answer so far. I would, like the, I would like to ask the Minister if he would, across government, seek to publish the payment guidelines and the timing of major payments being made within the 30, 60, and 90 days, which I understand is current practice within GB, and would actually go a long way to helping people understand whether the government is making prompt payment and further payment downstream from that. Yeah, um, uh, Steve, um, um, Mr. Rick, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy to encourage that to happen if it, if it isn't happening at the minute. I mean, the, uh, I have met now uh, the key group of the, from the construction industry, I think at least twice, and I've met their representatives, and I've gone out to visit some of them on site in Mahara and also in, in, in East Belfast, uh, including, including the quarry industry. And uh, the one thing that I, I am resolved to do in concert with uh, executive ministers is first of all make sure we uh, green light projects and we start projects and we deliver them. But the other thing is we need to get the money spent. If, it, if anything that helps that transparency, I would like to encourage. So you can take it that, and I think the, the industry accepts this that there is really no sense at all in us uh, trying to provide an economic stimulus to the construction sector by green lighting projects, but then the money not being uh, spent and allocated promptly. Declan Kearney. I get a free to call you. Uh, 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 Aaron, our canon Kearney, I guess a hog Edwin puts, and Jocolat Corsius are in a smart one, a quarter of them are in a colocty, not naked, full Conra Hori Saku in arm. Uh, building on the question raised by Edwin Putz, Minister, could you explain to us what are the sanctions in place for firms which fail to pay their subcontractors in good time. Can you, um, uh, bless you to the, to the chair of the committee as well. Glacum are in agus an feminist ga han da rira na kolokti nak nakin a gudge fo con rahori an am. Factor shaws na hear wachi to grow lokti a glacken parch a glactis den sort shaw majula conner he realtish no jeti chastis me hasu feimiak de vronuorhu. 
JT Gugger, her Cusker and Grolochti, and Chastis Marsha, Kurish Jacker, Comertish, Holler Her Pibli, or Fai Trevsha, Nakfudja, Natri Blaina. The failure of a firm to pay its subcontractors promptly is a matter which the executive in my department takes very seriously. The ramifications for firms which engage in such practices in government contracts reflect this, as they may be issued with a certificate of unsatisfactory performance. Receipt of this certificate can result in those firms being excluded from public procurement competitions for a period of up to three years. Sir Philip Smith, I call Philip. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question four, please, Minister. Um, th th thank you, Mr. Uh, Smith. Uh, as you are aware, I met with David Gawke, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, on the 21st, 24th of October. Uh, the British Treasury continued to refuse to guarantee to replace EU funds lost after the exit, if it happens, from the EU. Uh, my belief is that the British Government needs to underwrite not only funds up to the point of leaving the EU, but also income streams that would have been available to us afterwards. Uh, there remains considerable uncertainty. And considerable uncertainty is, uh, I suppose, diplomatic language because I see I was away for a short period and I see things becoming even more confused in my absence. But there remains considerable uncertainty for projects without this guarantee of continued funding and confirmation of the date, of course, of, of uh, uh, leaving the EU if that happens. Uh, and, and the member will have heard me say this, I hope, publicly as well, or in the House. The York Street interchange uh, project remains a, remains a priority for the executive and for me, uh, and in view of this, a joint working group involving my department, Strategic Investment Board, uh, and the Department for Infrastructure has been established to look at this, at this project. Philip Smith for a supplement. Uh, thank the Minister for, for his answer. Uh, Minister, James Brokenshire's recently as the 25th of October said, the Treasury will guarantee funding for structural and investment fund projects signed, I repeat, signed before the UK leaves the EU, even where projects continue after we leave. And I, ho I hold in my hand here a copy of a press release dated 15th of March earlier this year from the then Minister Michelle McElveen, where she explicitly states construction will commence in 2017. So can the Minister tell me who I should believe, the Treasury or the Executive, as both can't be right on the funding of York Street Interchange Scheme? On all cases, Philip, don't believe the NIO or the Treasury. In all cases where there's a difference of opinion, uh, but let's, let's be, and you know, I had, when David Gawke had the meeting, he had the, the devolved region secretaries of state in there as well, who were reasonably mute during the meeting. But the situation for me summed up in the analogy, if uh, I had wanted to build a house and I had the money to build 60% of it, that would be great. But would you really do that if you didn't have a guarantee of the other 40%? And some of our transport in particular projects dating out away that we would perhaps not even go out to tender, uh, or we, and Europe would, not off, Europe would not request bids for until 2018. There's no certainty that that extra 40 per cent, so you could build 100 per cent of your home, there's no certainty that that money would be delivered, that letters of offer would be signed off before there is an exit, if there is an exit uh, by the British uh, from the EU. So my, uh, while, while I have, of course, enormous sympathy uh, with, with you being caught between the NIO and the executive or, or myself, I assure you, you will always find a safe berth here, and you should, you should place, your trust, place your trust in the Finance Minister at all times. Sir Jerry Kelly. Thank you, Minister, for his answer up to now. And following on from that, uh, could, he, uh, could the Minister give an update on peace and interreg uh, funding? I don't know. Well, Colonel uh, Mohedafri, I'll ask you, I thank the member for, for, for his uh, question. And, you know, it's important to say, because when we, we met recently, I think two Fridays ago, we met in Greenmount College in County Antrim to discuss uh, EU funding, and uh, 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 representatives from right across the, the north and farther afield, indeed, uh, worried about EU funding, but also worried about government uh, investment plans. And I, and I said then, and we should say again, that this executive is deeply committed, 100 per cent committed, to the flagship projects, which include, of course, the A5, the A6, uh, the Belfast Transport Hub, the Mother and Children's Hospital, Hospital Desert Crete, and, of course, the regional and sub-regional stadia. And why the, the groups that, that gathered want that reassurance is they understand that it's not only about EU funding, uh, that, that we need a joined-up approach to growing the economy. But I am pleased that since that meeting we guaranteed that the monies that I have direct responsibility for, interreg and peace funding, that letters of offer would go out. And 
since, since you'd be pleased to know that just because I'm out of the country, government doesn't stop. Letters of offer did issue last week uh, to interreg projects uh, and also to um, the uh, to, to the peace, peace projects. Let me just, just clear that. Let's see, there, there are 10 uh, interreg letters of offer. Uh, we'll lay you that the week begins the 7th of November, which is, I believe, this week. So I believe that those are now in the post or have gone. Uh, that includes Swell Project on Environment Theme, Co Innovate ITI, ITI SME Project, five health projects, and three green light projects. Uh, and the first Peace Stage 2 Steering Committee on the 2nd of November committed £13.4 million to the Victims and Survivors Service. Apologies for that long answer for you. Last Concordia. I call Emma Little Bengali. Thank you, Principal uh, Speaker. Um, the Minister will accept, I'm sure, that the issue around guarantees um, on EU funding is not just an issue for here, but actually an issue right across the United Kingdom in terms of both uh, protecting the infrastructure projects but ensuring that pipeline continu continues. Um, I am concerned in terms of what the Minister has said about the that. A question. There have been attempts by Treasury clearly to clarify and guarantee. What further actions are you taking to satisfy the Department and the Executive that the guarantees are there to ensure that these uh, projects can go ahead? Well, uh, for, for you last, Concordia, I actually accept their guarantees, even with uh, my earlier comments to Philip. You know, when, when the British government say they will guarantee the monies until an accident of it happens, I accept that. But what they won't do, and these are the two areas we, we disagree on. One, uh, and this relates particularly to large infrastructure projects, if the letters of offer aren't issued by the time of an accident, which could be March 2019 for our friends in England and Wales, if a letter of offer isn't issued, they're not guaranteeing, they're not guaranteeing funding. And that's a gap. And they need to fill it. But as well as that, they need to give us a guarantee now going forward when the cap money disappears, will they replace it? Because, of course, that's absolutely essential because payments uh, for agriculture from the EU, which go to, to what you call the UK, 10% end up here. If it was a Barnet consequential, of course, only 3% would end up here. So we need the British government to close that gap as well. They need to guarantee that all the funding we receive at the moment under EU programmes will continue to flow here. And, and I say that in particular in relation to many of the groups I met, whether from the Bog side, Tigers Bay, South Armagh, uh, whom we met at Greenmount College, because those people were already looking ahead, uh, to some of them to, to Peace and Interreg, some to other funds, and saying, what happens, what happens if, if uh, uh, we are pushed out of Europe? Who will guarantee our funding to the Cedar Group? Uh, who will guarantee the, the funding to the, the Wave Group? Who will uh, guarantee the funding to Relis for Justice? And the answer is that the British are refusing to guarantee that. So I accept when Chancellor Hammond says, up until exit, any letters of offer are signed, he will stand over them. I do accept that. But he needs to go farther. He needs to say that the letters of offer are signed after that, particularly for large infrastructure projects, they will stand over those as well. And then he needs to tell us how he's going to fill the gap in the time ahead. I call Jim Allister. <laughs> Clearly it isn't, but should it not be beneath the Minister to scaremonger on this issue? The Chancellor's commitment is very, very clear has the member a question? that he will underwrite projects has the member, signed has the until member a the date. I'm seeking to ask it if I was permitted. The project signed to the point when the UK leaves and we will leave. Could the member come to his question, please? It's not please? to the point of letters of offer. It's the point of, con of project signed. And that clearly extends to the interchange at York Street as much as anything else. But is the minister and his colleague in infrastructure simply trying to drag their feet to make a case against Brexit? If you'd listened to that answer, I'd asked it. Question there that you might there, no, there is. There's a great saying in Irish, Aitnian Kiro Kiro Gala, which I suppose means one beetle recognises another. But um, I certainly don't recognise myself as a scaremonger. But I do know one person in this house has a good reputation in that regard. The issue remains, Mr. Allister, and I'm great that you have the certainty, which no one in London can give us, because uh, Brexit means Brexit, but Brexit, but it is a nominee shambles, and it has got more confusing in the last uh, seven days. So. Regardless of what you wish to happen, I'm actually only interested not in scaremongering, but getting the facts and getting the guarantee. And I've said to Mr. Smith and others, I'm happy with the guarantee uh, over peace money. I'm happy with the guarantee over interreg money. I'm happy with the guarantee until the date of an exit. I'm not happy that letters of offer 
uh, contracts that are signed off that after a departure, because the British will not guarantee those, and they need to, so we can plan to build, as I said, 100% of that house, not 60% of that house. That may work where you're from, where I'm from, we build the roof as well. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. I was here Sir Alex Ashwood. I call Alex Ashwood. Thank you. The Minister, you referred earlier to councils being bold in vision and not sit on their hands and work in partnership. Do you agree that the transfer of regeneration powers to our councils would actually help councils be bold in vision? And are you making that representation to the Department of Communities? I thank, I, thank, I thank the member for his uh, question. Um, uh, I, I don't uh, make a lot of representations to other departments. Usually they make representations to me. Uh, but what I have done since my appointment is I have had a, uh, I suppose a, a scale of engagement with councils, which I think you would accept is unprecedented for a finance minister. I have visited uh, Mayor Wales in Ballymena Council. I have visited uh, Lord Mayor Kingston in Belfast Council. I have been to Newry Council, uh, Mayor, Chair Fitzpatrick, I think, several times in the Fermanagh. So I am, I think, a, a, a booster for councils. I'm an advocate for more powers. And yes, I would like to see the, the, the rapid speeding up of their ability to make a major contribution to the economic growth of our area. So uh, I don't spend a lot of time making representations, but I think my record shows where I stand in terms of councils having the ability to, to match their ambition in the time ahead. Alex Ashwood for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer and I hope that the good engagement with councils will now translate into good representations to communities. And at the same time, would you agree that uh, city deals is another mechanism whereby councils in the north on a regional or city basis could access funds in order to regenerate their cities? And in that regard, is there a change of heart in, in the department, given what appeared to be resistance, certainly at an official level, uh, in the previous mandate to city deals for Northern Ireland? Well, uh, I thank the member for a supplementary. Uh, a young councillor who you may know called Tim Atwood is a strong advocate for city deals. I met him uh, at a meeting I had with the councils in Lisbon, and I attended a partnership panel chaired by the Department for Communities Minister. Uh, Paul Given recently uh, as well, where we engage with councils. I have an open mind on, on city deals, uh, and, and I know our friends in, in across the water some of have engaged us and embraced us uh, more vigorously than we have. Uh, what I have said to, to Councillor Atwood uh, previously is if people want to bring forward proposals, they should. I, I do have uh, certain reservations about falling back and asking our friends in London to. Uh, grant us and, and be dependent on them for a, a, a stepping up of the pace of, of growth in Belfast or Derry or other areas. But I have an open mind on it and I am quite happy for people to bring proposals forward. But of course, they would not go to me. I, I suspect they will go to the Executive Office or they would go to, to uh, Minister Hamilton first. Aram, sir, Philip Smith. I call Philip Smith for topical question. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, the Bank of England projects consumer price inflation to rise to 2.7% in the final quarter of 2017. What impact do you believe that will have on next year's budget? Well, uh, um, I've had it said as the Bank of Ireland. I may be more uh, solicitous to your, to your question, but in, in all seriousness, um, well, of course, my budget is my budget, so the rate of inflation will not affect the money and the cash we have at hand. But you know the dangers of inflation. Um, while it will put pressure on the public wage bill, because people will say, and with much, much justification, that the cost of living has gone up, therefore I need uh, an enhanced wage bill. Uh, if, of course, the, 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 the inflation pushes up the cost of food, and we've already seen that, uh, some of this is a consequence of, of course, the, the uh, Brexit, which I, I'm not sure, Mr. Smith, what side you were on at the time, were you for uh, remain or for leave? But I expect you're all for leave now. But of course, some of this, uh, uh, the, the spike in inflation, is due and will be due to the uh, uncertainty surrounding a Brexit. So, is is a little bit of inflation good? I think it is. If inflation goes above uh, and two percent has been the the, the watchword for for governments across Europe, if inflation surges ahead. It is, in my view, it will certainly be uh, bad news for those who are at the bottom of the economic ladder, those who are already struggling with their household bills. Uh, some of that we have control over, uh, much of it we don't. But I think in the time ahead, what we have to do 
and I think you'll agree with this, is we need to make sure that our own economy uh, picks up pace, picks up speed, and provides more jobs and opportunity in the time ahead, uh, so that we aren't caught in this face of inflation growing, but at the same time, this uh, recession that's about to hit us as well. Philip Smith for a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank the Minister for, for his initial answer. Uh, officials recently before the Finance Committee indicated uh, the executive budget would face a further reduction or pressure of 4.4% next year. Uh, is there any provisional indication of what impact this, along with presumably additional spending for health uh, on the back of Bengoa, uh, will have on other departments' baselines? Well, um, I'm, always, I'm always hopeful that when Mr Smith gets up, he will tell me that he has been speaking to the Treasury and asked him to make, or he's made representations, to use the word of Mr Atwood, in relation to the budget cut. It isn't a 4.4 per cent cut uh, next year, but over the period of this mandate, between now and 2020, uh, the, budgets will go, the resource budget will be uh, subject to a 4 per cent plus cut from London. And that, indeed, is a major challenge to all of us, because, as you know, uh, wage, wages are going up at least, at least 1 per cent, and we know there's pressure uh, for an additional increase above that. So we are under enormous challenges, and I said this to Mr Gawk when we met in London last week. The greatest thing that he could do uh, to provide an economic stimulus is to say that there would be an end to that austerity agenda, because that is the austerity agenda continuing. It may be austerity light, but it's continuing, and it's a direct uh, instruction uh, and, and mandate uh, from London, of which we have no say, and that is that we have to cut our resource budget by 4 per cent. I know that you come went to the dance with the Conservative Party. I don't know how relations are. I think you maybe have moved on to another partner. Uh, but if you have any influence, I suggest you apply that influence uh, to Mrs May and to Mr Hammond to say to them that we are under enough pressure uh, balancing our budgets, building our economy, building a shared future uh, without this 4.1 uh, per cent cut. Claire Bailey is not in her place. I call Nelson McCausland. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Finance Minister is uh, a person who has uh, considerable interest in uh, links between uh, Northern Ireland and uh, the United States of America. He's also very conscious of... Has the member of... a question? That is a question. I'm getting to the question. Yes, I had to preface it with just a line or two. I'm sure if you bear with me for a moment... Uh, Yes. I think uh, a little bit of uh, opportunity would for me to just preface it with one or two sentences. Challenging the authorities. No, I, the I'm simply trying can, to get asking my question. Can the member come to his I, question? I will please. as soon as I get an opportunity, uh, or Madam Deputy Speaker. Mm -hmm. um, the um, Minister, Finance Minister is very aware of the uh, strong cultural links between uh, Northern Ireland and America and also the potential for uh, culture as a source of soft Could the power. member come to his question? Would, would since call half of the, the people in Northern Ireland with roots on the island of Ireland are of Scotch Irish descent, uh, what would his assessment be of the potential to utilise those cultural and historical connections for the economic benefit of Northern Ireland? Which I think does constitute, in fact, a question. Can I remind the member that questions are supposed to be brief and to the point? Minister. Um, I think actually the, the potential, uh, as the member will know in the US, I think it's 33 million people uh, ascribe themselves as a, an Irish American identity and about 7 million as Scots Irish. I think that the opportunity has still not been fully seized uh, to leverage the great sympathy and support that we have uh, among this, that Scots Irish cohort in the US. Uh, I believe it's not only tourism, I believe it can translate into educational links, it can translate into economic partnerships, it can translate into investment. Uh, the greatest, uh, I think, impact uh, that we can make when we travel uh, to the US isn't when we uh, deliver a, a message which is targeted just at the Irish American or just at the Scots Irish. But when you talk about Planter and Gale together, I think that's the type of message Scots Irish and Irish American together, I think, are much stronger than either apart. Nelson McCausland for a supplementary. Uh, the, um, some might argue that the Gales were planters as well, but um, the point uh, I would make uh, in terms of supplementary questions is simply this. Um, would the Minister undertake to uh, work with the relevant folk in the um, Department of Communities and the Minister there in the Department of Communities who have responsibility for the Ulster Scots Agency to see if some additional resources could be uh, afforded there to enable them to work up? Uh, some additional work because of the, uh, in that context because of the fact that the budget of the Ulster Scots Agency is so much lower than the budget for um, uh, Forest of Gaelic. 
Minister. I think that emerges a com complaint rather than a question. I have written, recently written to the board, uh, and I'm happy to uh, widen the discussion to include their approach to the U.S. Uh, if it's any help, I'll make myself available as a resource. I've been promising to go to Atlanta in particular and Niceville, and I've never made that visit, but um, I, do, I do believe there's more that can be done, and I am hoping to uh, get a response from the board uh, to the letter I sent them, and perhaps we can, we can widen out the discussion to include the U.S. Aaron, sir, Catherine Seeley. I call Catherine Seeley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, following a question I asked him in previous question time in relation to marriage equality, for an update on the commitment he made? Ara. Y yes, and I, and I thank the member for her question. Well, as, as, as she may have um, read or noted, uh, I brought forward to the executive uh, not last week, but the week before, a proposal that I be allowed to bring forward a consultation on a marriage equality bill. Uh, that was voted down uh, in the executive, um, and therefore I can't proceed as minister with that bill on marriage equality. Uh, I therefore, I suppose, as it were, hand the baton over to the private members, and I know there are a number of private members who wish to bring forward a, a, a bill on marriage equality, and that, of course, will have my support. Catherine Seeley for supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his answer, but I am disappointed that that was the response from the Executive. Can I ask the Minister if the issue of marriage equality was raised during his recent visit to the US? Um, yeah, yes, but the, the Member should not shouldn't be disappointed in these matters. As, as a, another famous Atlantan said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I am confident that we will, in this little part of uh, this small island and these islands, we will see uh, marriage equality here. Yes, this issue does come up in the U.S. Uh, it comes up probably in that, I suppose, the capital of diversity in uh, the U.S. is San Francisco when I was there last week, and it does come up. Uh, there is a great belief that the prosperity of uh, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, is based on what uh, Richard Florida refers to as the three T's, uh, technology, talent, and tolerance. Uh, each are equally important to me. Uh, you will find that many of our friends in the US, to use your word, are disappointed that we haven't made enough progress on this issue because it is seen very much as a civil rights issue in the US. Um, and, and I have no doubt that uh, they would be heartened. I think many of the companies I've met, and it is of interest in recent years, it is the large companies, uh, large multinational companies in some cases, such as Citigroup in this city, who have made a strong stance in support of diversity. And I have no doubt they will, in the appropriate time, make their views known. Edwin Poots is not in his place. I call Tom Buchanan. Thank you. Uh, Minister, in recent correspondence to me with regard to uh, civil service pay for those within the prison service and the PSNI, you did say that you were in, in discussions with the Secretary of State, James Brokenshire, on this matter. Can you give us uh, uh, some progress as to how that is, is processing? Uh, Today, uh, you know, just uh, what progress has actually been made on that matter? Well, I thank Mr. Buchanan for his, his vigilance and commitment to this issue. I did write to the Secretary of State, um, and uh, I think the ball is in their court uh, in relation to uh, an equal pay settlement for that cohort of workers you referred to. Uh, I have not received a satisfactory answer at this time, but I will, I will certainly keep in touch with him on the issue. Uh, as he's aware, there's no obligation. Uh, in terms of statute on the executive to make that payment, but I'm also aware that my, my, many members feel there is a, a moral commitment. Unfortunately, moral commitments are, are, are not exactly the same. I call Stuart Dixon. Sorry, uh, sorry uh, Mr. Dixon. I forgot to call uh, Mr. Buchanan for a supplementary. My apologies. Thank you. Thank the Minister for his response. But will the Minister give a commitment that if progress is not made soon with the Secretary of State on finding money for this, that he will then have further discussions with his executive colleagues and, and how funding can be found uh, for this particular matter? Well, I, refer, I, I, I admire your doggedness on this issue. Um, the advice, as you know, and, and Minister Wilson, former Minister Wilson, was very firm on this was that if we open this particular uh, genie's bottle, that we have no idea what it will cost to the executive and whether it be retrospective claims from other areas and other, other sub public servants who did receive payments. But I, I will give you this guarantee. Uh, I will uh, stay on Mr. Brokenshire's case until he has given us the, the reply 
uh, that we, we need on this matter because the ball is firmly in his court and he needs to, st he needs to step up and, and give us the answer and meet, he needs to meet his obligations. I called Stuart Dixon for a, a, supplement, a very brief supplementary and there will not be time for an answer but I want to give you the opportunity to make a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Minister, I just want to return again to the issue of the York Street interchange. Uh, and can we be assured that both you and the Infrastructure Minister are not playing political football with this in terms of your executive colleagues, and that you are making genuine efforts to secure the appropriate financing and to place this project rightly where it should be on the scale of projects in Northern Ireland? A very brief answer. I don't want to cry foul on that matter, but as you know, I don't play political football. We now must move on to questions.